I'm going to call this meeting to order the Inglewood Transportation Advisory Committee for today, uh, which would be October 8th, 2020. Um, start here with that. I was going to, and uh, I guess what first thing that we'll do is we'll have Lorraine call out the names and then answer accordingly of the members. Okay. Chair Sarno. Present. Vice Chair Lewis, my understanding he's absent. Correct. Member Dietrich. Present. Member Canadison. Here. Member O'Connell. Present. Member Plasters. Mayor Pro Tem Sierra. I'm here. Director DeAndrea. Present. Sergeant Mark McKay. Traffic Engineer Norris. I'm present. Traffic Operations Administrator Graf. Present. And Lorraine O'Gain, Business Support Specialist, I'm here. And we also have a couple of other folks who are doing presentations. We have Stephanie Carlisle, our city clerk. Present. Tom Sanders. Hello, Tom. Are you, are you there? Tom Sanders. Looks like he's uh, muted. Yeah, it looks like he's muted there. Um, there we go. Okay, I'm here. Thank you. Wade Burkholder. Present. Jen Gardner. Present. Okay, we've got a quorum. Okay, great. Thanks, Lorraine. Sure. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen now, with our agenda here. So let's get to that. I don't know if you can see that. <clears throat> and yeah, and actually there was a uh, Lorraine. If I'm correct, this was updated. Correct today. Um, the agenda. Correct, there was just an additional attachment added under the last item. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, good. Um, well, uh, first thing, the first order of business is approval, approval of minutes from our last ETAC meeting, September 10, 2020. Uh, I asked the committee if they've had the opportunity to go ahead and review those minutes and if they have any questions or comments regarding them, the minutes, recorded minutes. No comments on my end. Okay. okay. Greg, Tiffany? No comment or additions. Okay. Um, one, <clears throat> um, one, uh, I guess, change in the old business section. I think that the, the motion included that the uh, recommended speed for bikes traveling through an intersection would be 15 miles an hour or lower. Under the safety stop, correct, Greg? That's right. Old business yeah. safety stop, yeah. Okay, and so we would like, and so you're suggesting uh, revising uh, the language there, which says recommend safety stop to count city council for consideration as part of the modal traffic code update. Do you have a suggestion on what to add to that or? Um, I don't remember the language I used. I guess I should have paid closer attention when I was reading this earlier. Mm -hmm. 
Chair Sarno, I would also yes. suggest if we're changing that, it should be model, M-O-D-E-L, as opposed to modal. So um, that's the state traffic code essentially, and then we're making slight modifications to it, but that's the reference is model. I see. Yeah, so the, um, <clears throat> I'm just refreshing myself with what the 15 miles an hour was about. So it's, it's the reasonable speed that bicycles must be traveling at or under as they go through um, a stop sign. Uh, and so that's the recommendation to amend that to say that 15 miles an hour for traveling through a stop sign. 15 miles an hour for traveling through a stop sign, okay. Uh, so recommend safety stop to city council for consideration as part of the model, not modal, traffic code update with a maximum speed of 15 miles per hour for, go ahead, go ahead, Greg. Could you fill in the blank for me there? You yeah, just when traveling it. through a stop sign. 15 miles an hour wind traveling through through a stop sign. Yeah, basically the, the model language leaves that option to the state or leaves that option to the municipality and the recommendation from the state is sort of 15 as the default, but a municipality could choose a higher or lower value. Okay. Um, and that is actually what we did vote on, I believe, correct? We did have that in, in the, when we voted on that, I think that was a part of the conversation. So that's my memory is that it was in the motion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, hey, Neil, so, did you, Neil, I just wanted to say, did you also want to add that uh, Patrick Lewis or M member Lewis was absent during last meeting? Uh, it looks like only two names are captured. <clears throat> So at the very top. Let's see here. Uh, that is correct. Yeah, I think um, Member Lewis was absent at the last meeting as well, too. Yep. I guess this would be a question so, for Maria or Lorraine, but do we have to state how many members, what the uh, final vote was, whether it's three nothing in that case, or does it matter? Director DeAndre or I in looking at past minutes, we we don't write like motion unanimously or you know carried unanimously or anything like that. Um, we can certainly do that though. And good catch on on seeing that member Lewis wasn't there. Um, typically we don't write the you know who pat or who said I who didn't. Lorraine, but Lorraine, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you're right, Maria. I do think going forward, if you wanted to record a vote, you could uh, show who motioned and who second. And then there is a way that it could show which member voted and how they voted. But again, that's, um, I, I mean, there is that option if that's something um, that you're looking for, Mayor Pro Tem. No, I, I just, I was just kind of curious about it. Just, um, it was more of a question, so no, I'm fine with it as is. Yeah, I think it's pretty standard. Uh, I don't think we've ever, as long as I've been on this committee, um, ever had any specific uh, vote tally numbers. It was just a uh, passed or carried, uh, you know, passed or carried or did not. Right. Agreed. So. Um, so what we have then on board right now with the meeting minutes here are two items or two issues that I see here. One is adding under the absent category would be member Lewis as being absent at the previous meeting on September 10th and also updating the language under old business safety stop to recommend safety stops to be counseled for consideration as part of the model traffic code update um, with 15 miles per hour when traveling when traveling through a stop sign. Is that correct? Uh, 
Yes, and the uh, bicycles traveling 15 miles an hour when traveling through a stop sign, and then the E on the word model. Did you, uh, you know, for discussion? E on the word, right, not, not mode up. Yeah, not modal, but mo model, correct, Chris. Yeah. All right, any additional um, conversation with this or discussion to this? Not on my end. Okay. Do we have a motion to make these changes to the meeting minutes? Greg, you cut the... Okay. Mo yeah, uh, how about motion to approve them um, as Chair as amended. just described as amended, yeah. Okay. Do we have a I'll second to that. that? Okay, very good, Chris. Okay, um, any further discussion on this? Seeing that we have none right now, we can go for a vote. Lorraine, if you would go through our committee. Chair Sarno. Aye. Member Dietrich. Aye. Member Kananison. Aye. Member O'Connell. Aye. Very good. The guys have it. And so we can move on now to our next order of business. And that would be public forum. So we do have on the line with us, uh, Mr. Tom Sanders. Uh, Tom, if you can, well, state, state your address, please, for the committee. Yes, uh, my name is Tom Sanders. My address, 2369 East Floyd Place. Okay, very good. Um, thank you, thank you, Tom, for joining us. So. Uh, I did receive your communication, I believe it was yesterday. Uh, yes. And it was regarding, and it was regarding um, some of the traffic happening on university and some of the cutover traffic going onto Floyd Place. So I'll let you take it from there, Tom, with your concerns on that. So um, this was a last minute thing that I received for you. And unfortunately I didn't have the opportunity to pass it on to the city, but I know you had mentioned about wanting to participate on today's meeting. And so I wanted to at least get you involved and, uh, and speak your piece. And then of course the city will continue to follow up with whatever uh, you have at hand. So please well, thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, first of all, I want to, uh, shift the attention from um, University Boulevard itself. Uh, that's a pretty complicated uh, uh, street to try to uh, affect some changes. But what I want to do is uh, focus attention on Floyd Place itself. Uh, we have in the last years, uh, we have three issues um, with traffic on the street. Uh, we have uh, increased car and truck traffic on the street itself. It's really become a, a cut through street going east or west. It's um, only a one block street between Race Street and University and we have this increased traffic. The second issue is the speed of this traffic. As a cut through street, a lot of the traffic uh, of course would not be residents of the street so it appears that their uh, determination is, is to get to the end of the street. So they're driving faster. And then the last issue would be uh, the attentive, attentiveness of those non-residential drivers because they're trying to move through the street rather than go to a particular residence or house on the street. So I think, we have three issues on the street itself, and I wanted to bring those to the attention of the committee. I don't really know the best way to proceed to have some kind of a dialogue and analysis and so on and so forth to see if we can come up with some recommendations of how to make some changes. 
the letter that I wrote to you, Mr. Sarno, uh, I did bring forth some of my suggestions, but certainly I'd like to talk to uh, the committee in some way and talk to the city of Englewood. Uh, well, certainly there, uh, Mr. Sanders, you do have you know our attention, both of the committee and the city. We're here right now and uh, of course, willing to you know, listen to your concerns and address them. So right now what I've done is if, if you can confirm uh, just that I've put on the screen here, just a Google Earth snapshot of the area you're describing here, correct? Correct, and it's Floyd uh, Place. Floyd. It's just uh, south of Floyd yes, Avenue. Right. And Floyd Avenue would be the major arterial between University and Broadway into and out of the city of Inglewood whereas Floyd Place is a one block, I call it a one block street between University on the east side and Race Street on the west side. It's an attractive enough cut, what I call a cut through street uh, to convey traffic east and west. Uh, and in the 30 years that I've lived in this house, uh, I and my neighbors have seen an increase in the traffic volume uh, doing, doing that cut through. Right, I, th I think, um, Mr. Sanders, I spoke to this, I, I think at our last meeting, uh, if not a previous meeting, but it was regarding one of the changes I occasionally will make my way through this corridor as well. Uh, one of the changes you, you probably have noticed is that and I think it might've been CDOT had placed these do not block um, uh, signs or not signs, but actually um, on the roadway over here, striping That's or, yeah, you can actually see it there too. I think this has been probably within the last three or four years that this has happened. I don't know if it's, if this was prompted by some accidents or so forth that's happened there. Um, and I, I can't recall if we actually confirmed if it was CDOT that did it or if this was a city that installed these. Oh, yeah. Shocking announcement of arrest today and malicious details of a plan to storm the state capitol. And John is much more Lots of people taking shape this summer. And I repeated, you know, if I'm with a pan, you need to tell Rusty he needs a Judy, 13 people are in custody in Michigan. Because he has, and I even told that woman. Does someone have their radio on? He has no business. You can mute participants. Thank you. With regards to that, I can answer that question. When the Kent Place uh, development was done, uh, one of the concerns was as they installed a traffic light at, into the Kent Place uh, uh, shopping center, they put a traffic light in and the concern was traffic backing up uh, from that traffic light. So the developer agreed to paint uh, the square at the intersection with Floyd Place to at least keep that intersection open uh, during times that the traffic light had backed up the traffic. I see. So that was connected to the Kent Place development here. And that's, that's correct. And I think what's happened um, is people are going northbound on university, wanting to enter the city of Inglewood. They have two choices. They can two immediate choices, they can use Floyd Avenue or they can use Floyd Place. Uh, right. So which is the most convenient or attractive at any particular time? Uh, whereas in the past, Floyd Avenue being recognized as an arterial has always been the sort of the designated choice. But now uh, Floyd Place has become a choice and I think that's what's contributing to this increased traffic load on the street. Mm. I think for what it's worth and certainly Understood. we can talk about I think also, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, I think no, no, please, go ahead. situation, if we were, as we might discuss it, there may be some simple 
solutions to the street itself. Again, trying to uh, not get too involved with University Boulevard. And, and I may be wrong, but it just strikes me that anything that happens along that street would be fairly um, involved and complicated to, uh, to deal with. So maybe we just try to stick with doing things along Floyd Place. Yeah, this has been a, a topic in, that's in, uh, come in up regards quite to a problem solving the traffic. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a topic we've discussed several times lately, and and we've heard from uh, you know a few different sources uh, about kind of what's going on on the street, and and between talking with the police about um, traffic counts and uh you know accidents we've looked at quite a few of those things um in the in the past uh you know six months here here and and we kind of uh you know talked through and and decided you know there were some benefits and some drawbacks and and kind of talked about where do we focus our our time on this and and versus other places but i think this is you know something that does continue to come up and and uh you know I've, I'm curious what some of the traffic sources are. I'd love to see if, you know, maybe we, I don't remember what the most recent study was on that street, but, you know, if, if the city, this committee has, a, you know, bought the speed wagon that's around town, if we could, you know, maybe do some speed counts over there soon or some car counts and things like that as well to at least start getting a, maybe a more fresh picture of what's going on over there. Um, you know, if we've had something in the last six months there's, as you guys know, been less traffic in general everywhere. And so, you know, it's, it's slowly picking up now, but I think it might be worth looking into something like that. Um, you know, something that we haven't ever discussed and, and we don't need to go into detail today would be, you know, what if, uh, you know, we made it so it wasn't a through street anymore. Maybe did something on the university side. Uh, you know, there's, there's quite a few different options. We talked about, you know, no, no left turns off of that street. Um, and putting up some signs like that or things. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think there's probably a little bit more we can look at here. You know, if we've, we've got concerned citizens, it's a, you know, a block of what, 15, 20 houses. And, uh, you know, we've, we've heard a couple of th complaints from this area. You know, the, the accident um, statistics at that intersection, particularly at university, are not really outstanding per some of the more recent data that we've looked at. But, you know, per what Tom said, uh, you know, don't, focus as much on university it's, it's more on the Floyd place where some of these habits are happening so uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's more data gathering we can do or something or uh, you know maybe you kind of put together a few of the pieces of research that we've uh, brought up in in the recent you know year or so or something and, and kind of look at this I'd love to hear what else the committee thinks or the city uh, you know I'd like to make sure we give Tom uh, you know some time to look into what his concern is. I think, uh, Chris, that, um, and correct me, Tom, if I'm wrong, but in the letter that you sent to me, you did have a suggestion about a no left turn sign for those, I believe, going northbound, correct, onto Floyd Place. And then, uh, and then likewise, a no left for um, eastbound off of Floyd to go northbound onto University. Was that a suggestion of yours? Yes, it was. That's correct. Okay. So I think that's in keeping with what you had just mentioned as well there too, Chris. Um, I just have a, something similar to add to that in terms of, I feel like this is a very similar scenario that we're finding also on East Dartmouth Place, where I think there's some, although probably not as as much in, or as, as heavy as um, Floyd Place, but on East Dartmouth Place, you have the same situation where you have some people, if there's a, if it's on red here at Dartmouth and University at the intersection, people cutting over onto Dartmouth Place as well, and then trying to loop around and tie back in. So um, whether it's probably to the volume of traffic that you're discussing on Floyd, I'm not certain, but I think it's a very similar situation there. So if this is something that possibly we can discuss with the city in terms of putting out, as you mentioned, some traffic counts and, and understanding what's actually going on there, especially I would probably guess during rush hour, 
in the morning and in the evening uh, that could lead us to some determination of, of what's happening and to what degree. So, uh, I have a question for the city then. A, a guy or Director Andrea, did, has, has there been anything that's come across, I guess, your desks at all regarding this issue or other than what we've discussed in ETAC or has, has any other residents that, are, that you're aware of uh, communicated this problem to the city? I think uh, just Sergeant McKay had made us aware of it. So I don't know if we have had any direct contact with any residents, but we can certainly um, look at when our latest counts were and put out counts there to compare like, let's say Floyd Avenue with Floyd Place and just see the difference. And similarly with Dartmouth and Dartmouth Place to see if those suggestions are warranted. One thing I might interject, I think, at Dartmouth Place, they have um, taken and added a turn lane at Dartmouth Place going northbound. Sometimes I'll actually go to Dartmouth Place to avoid the left turn at uh, Floyd or Floyd Place. I think they might have a turn lane there, which is um, interesting because it appears to me to be the same width of road. Um, but anyway, that could be something to put into our, as we look at this in greater detail, we could see how that has had an effect or not had an effect. There's a, a left turn lane so from northbound university onto uh, westbound Dartmouth Avenue, I think, but not at Dartmouth Place. Uh, well, I, yes, I guess I, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how that all, once they reconstructed it to get the left turns in there, I thought maybe I'm wrong. I thought Dartmouth Place might have been included with a left turn, but you're right, perhaps it's just the Dartmouth. I, I believe so, so there, Tom. Yeah, that was part of the, the uh, traffic signal improvements that were recently accomplished, I think within the last year, so. Well, I would but be glad that, that, that could be confirmed. I would be glad to participate in any way I can to either help or dialogue or do whatever I can to uh, work with ETAC and the city to kind of analyze this whole issue. Very good. Um, well, as, as Chris had mentioned there, Tom, you know, this has been part of ETAC's conversation, at least sporadically. Um, so we can continue this um, and um, yeah, try to come up with some solutions. So, and in partnering with the city on this. So um, as mentioned, you know, you, I just received this from you yesterday. I have not sent your communication, your letter over to the city. I'm more than willing to do that if you're okay with that as well yes, please do. Um, but we're just yeah and so and i'm happy that you're able to join us and at least just communicate uh to uh, to the committee here uh what your concerns are and so okay. we're doing that so occasionally it takes us a little bit of time to uh, to go forward and gather this information just as director andrea had mentioned and and so on and at the city uh, but we can continue to circle back to you and, you know, essentially inform of you where we're at or feel free to contact us as well. Well, great. I appreciate uh, you hearing me and I look forward to staying in touch with you. Yeah. I just, one last question here and I, or comment. Um, so Director Andrea, uh, Guy, do you guys have any protocol or anything else that you would like from us, from my, either from the committee or from Mr. Sanders here in terms of information provided to you as a formality or? No, I think we're good. If you could pass on that letter chair to us, then um, uh, Mr. Sanders, does that have your contact information on there? Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah, so we'll, we'll collect that data and um, 
kind of analyze further what we can do and then we'll circle back with both Mr. Sanders and the committee. All right, thank you. Very good. Is there anything else, Mr. Sanders? No, that's, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for participating. And uh, yes, we will certainly keep this on our agenda and, and keep you informed as well moving forward. Good. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay. We're asking for asking officials from you today. How do you ask questions? Is there a format or what? Hello? No. Yes. Is there a format for asking questions or are you going to go down the streets or how's this working? Okay, who, uh, just a second. Who, who's this that's speaking here? Richard. Okay, let me, yeah, let's get you involved here, Richard. Um, just a second. I, if, first off, just if you want to just share your name and address, and then you can just speak to the committee. This, this is the public forum part of the, of our meeting. Okay, Richard Burton, 3031 South Tacoma Street. Okay. Okay. So that's Richard Burton, correct? Yes. And the address one more time. I apologize. Go ahead. 3031 South Coma Street. South Coma Street. Okay. Very good, Mr. Burton. Welcome to the uh, Inglewood Transportation Advisory Committee meeting. Um, Feel free, this is a public forum and this is our area or section of the agenda to reach out and have the public speak to us. So please go ahead and let us know what your concern is. Okay, uh, Dartmouth and Acoma and uh, Bates, Cornell, those that stretch through there. When we had the Chick-fil-A pre-building meetings, we discussed a lot of traffic issues that were going to become a problem. Nothing has came of any of those issues we talked about at those meetings. I have lived in this house 67 years. Uh, we've always had a problem at Cornell and Acoma with the uh, screw traffic ditching Broadway and coming there because there is no traffic signals. And then when Kaiser was built, it became worse. And now the Chick-fil-A there is there it's terrible not only getting across dartmouth and a coma but everybody turns and flies down a coma street or they turn from broadway and bates and flies down a coma because they don't have to stop and they miss all the backed up traffic on broadway uh, I talked to Lad when before he retired uh, about a four-way stop at uh, Acoma and Cornell to help slow these cars down. And with the coming of all these duplexes and stuff, we have more kids playing and stuff, and he's people are, I mean, the speed is ridiculous. So that's my issues right now. Okay, so, so Mr. Burton, as you mentioned, you're on Acoma Street, and right now you've mentioned several intersections or at least roadways that, that seem to be problematic. So you're saying at Cornell and Acoma, right here, this is, if you could see my screen here, uh, the, the group can. Uh, this is where you 
suggested a four-way stop previously to uh, Lad, who was the previous uh, city traffic engineer. Right. Correct. Yeah. And so you're, you're finding that there's speeding happening on Acoma as well as Cornell. And you also mentioned, I think, Bates as well, too. Well, yes, they turn off Broadway on the Bates, and then they miss the traffic on Broadway, and they don't have to stop at Cornell, so they, they speed up to Dartmouth. There's nothing to stop them. I see. So I guess for yourself, it would be you're looking at it from the going in a southbound direction, although possibly it could be going now northbound as well, too. But if yes. yeah, could we do the from... same thing both directions, one to get off Broadway and one to get off Dartmouth. And with the new businesses as Chick-fil-A and Kaiser have developed, there is so much traffic. I know Lab did a car count, and he told me at that time that he saw what I was talking about. Uh, I retired from the city. And me and Lad had several uh, conversations about the traffic. I'm, I'm yeah, curious. I, I want to chime in on this one real quick because um, no, not only was I in on all of those conversations, I believe uh, you know that Richard may be right. I, it might even show up in the traffic study that that was. A, potentially one of the things that they were looking at. So I, I would love to look back at this. And, and it's also just around the corner from my house. And it's something that also affects me. Um, but he's totally right. You know, when we put in the Chick-fil-A, they got rid of the alley that went all the way through. And then also, you know, the car counts. If you look at how massive the stacking is for their line there, uh, for their drive through, there is a significant amount of traffic that came through that does go through there and and it all does use the coma so uh, richard you know i personally also feel your pain on those cars coming down that street but uh you know i i think it would be good if maybe we could look back at some of that stuff uh the four-way stop specifically was something that we discussed i believe uh there were a couple of venues that we could have gone through to do that one of them if not all of them required uh, some sort of outreach to the property owners on each of the corners. I think there were a couple of steps that needed to go in for that. And I think the city actually was relatively open to it. Uh, I think nobody took the initiative and it had to be those property owners. So I'd love to revisit that. Um, and I, I'm looking at you, Andrea, here <laughs> to, to help uh, out with that a little bit. But um, this is something that did come up and, and uh, you know, if we may, you know, if we want to follow the process and do the traffic counts again and compare them to previously or, you know, do all the right things that we need to do to look at this. But this is an, an area that I've been kind of waiting to bring up and, you know, Richard coming here and, and talking about it just shows that, um, you know, it is something that the people in the area are concerned about. Um, because he's totally right, that stretch from Bates down, uh, people come flying southbound and northbound. He didn't mention Jimmy John's, but they're also an issue <laughs> in yes. that area. Those guys are freaky fast, and they are on the road, too. So, um, you know, I, I think this would definitely be worth looking at, and, and we probably, you know, we'll want to follow the process, but um, I think there's already some materials from the traffic studies and everything on this that might be worth pulling up. Chris, Chris, do you recall which intersection that was where the four stop four way stops were proposed? Yeah, it was it was Cornell. Cornell, it was Cornell and Acoma, and currently it's a two way stop. And and actually, the way that the intersection is set up and the way the cars park on those corners, because there is quite a bit of rental property right around there, um, the cars park right up to the corners, and it's pretty unsafe. Uh, it, it's even going east or westbound on Cornell. It's like it's hard to see cars coming because of the way cars park there, there's some big trucks, but also because of the speed of the cars. Um, I frequently go through that intersection and I always have to creep and creep a little bit because I'm always nervous that somebody's going to be flying through there, french fries in their mouth and one hand on the wheel. Um, I know that's a little pragmatic to say it that way, but uh, that's 
you know, I, I hear what Richard's saying, and I think this would at least be worth looking at a little bit. Like I say, I've lived in this house 67 years, and I've watched, and I uh, the changes have been dramatic. It's like I said, with the new duplexes going in, that's more people on these streets, and it's the Chick Fil A is very busy Sunday is not a bad day, but you know, people still, they just know they don't have to stop and they, they book to the next stop sign. So uh, I would really appreciate something being looked at. Like I said, me and Lyad had several conversations about that corner. All right. Never steps up. Very good. Is this something, um, Guy or uh, Director Andrea, again, it, it, in terms of going back through some files, old files, or what have you, to find out what traffic counts were previously done at what time, and then perhaps compare them with some new data? Is that a, a thought that can be? Yeah, if there's if there's someone who has like some background, like a radio or something something going on, if they could just tune that down just a little bit, pretty audible. Yeah, we can look back to okay. what the previous discussion was and probably get um, police to put out some the speed trailers on that street as well, just to see what the current data is. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm having a little technical trouble. I mean, another option too would be, I mean, it'll see what, because yeah, I know there's, um, finding it might be a little difficult, but obviously there's, I, I've seen the Chick-fil-A uh, traffic study, I didn't read it, but um, um, option might be, it's, I'm kind of surprised that uh, is maybe even uh, if it would be appropriate to reverse the stop signs at a Coma and Cor uh, Cornell, not necessarily going to a four-way stop, but um, uh, is put into stop signs in the other direction. Yeah, that's so, a good idea, Guy. Yeah, because honestly, because of, that's kind of how a lot of a coma is configured. People think it is to slow people down a coma, but it's actually kind of makes sense. It's so close to Broadway to maybe possibly have it in the other direction anyway. I mean, we could get some counts and look at the, always stop but it seems like more likely that uh, that would be something that would uh would be more supported by the counts yeah that that would be there's a stop sign east westbound at bannock as well so it's two blocks in a row with that east west stop sign right there so yeah that would guys, be an improvement at least i think guys on mute Yeah, I'm surprised I didn't know that. I used the Kaiser and Chick Fil A. If there's one at uh, yeah, Banning, so East too. Westbound, that makes sense. So maybe can we get this on on the agenda? Um, you know, would it make sense for the next one? I know we've already talked about two projects with you guys putting out um, cameras and counts and things like that. But um, you know, I want to make sure this gets on a future agenda because I think it's definitely worth revisiting. Uh, what would be, you know, I'm looking kind of to the city, you know, what uh, sort of timeline would, would you guys be comfortable with having enough time to look into this? Yeah, I'll defer to Guy on that. He's talking, but he's muted. Yeah, yeah you're you're on mute, mute guy. Yeah, sorry, I'm having trouble. My computer's kind of acting up. Um, I can't even see you guys right now. Uh, so I would, I guess, for now, we just assume it's on the next agenda, and if something comes up, then we'll inform Neil before, ahead of time. So sounds good, guys. So with that, I think since we're talking about that in terms of what to put on the agenda specifically, we'll have two items, if you will, right now. One would be Mr. Sanders 
for um, East Fulford Place and this right here from Mr. Burton as well too on the coma. Okay. All right. Very good. Is, is that good, Mr. Bernard? Is there anything else you'd like to contribute? Oh, I appreciate the time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Appreciate your uh, your input on this. As well. So, the city will we'll get back to you, or will it become this part of our next uh, ETAC agenda meeting. So, uh, we'll certainly track this down for you. Find Thank out you. A good That's a good solution. Welcome. Okay, with that, we'll ask if there's anyone else there for public forum. If not, we'll continue to move on to the next item on the agenda here. Okay. Okay, let's begin with old business. Uh, meeting protocol, City of Inglewood Board and Commission's policies, final obstacles of order 2018. So I don't know if the committee has had an opportunity to look through the, look through this item. And I think this kind of revolved around some of the open meetings laws that were um, came up, I think a few meetings back and what's acceptable, what isn't uh, in different scenarios. So, and I think if I can go to, is it Stephanie? Yep. Hi, Stephanie. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? So, yes, we can. I, I can. Okay, great. Well, thank you guys for having me. I'm just here to be a resource for all of you. Um, certainly, um, I think that, you know, getting this handbook out to you um, is, would be great for your, uh, your board to have it take some time to periodically review it. Um, we're actually in the middle of looking at doing some revisions. And so we would love the board's input on that. But, um, but yeah, the biggest thing is just some of the, the nuances of the open, open meetings law. Um, so it is kind of outlined in this handbook, sort of the very um, scaled back version of the open meetings law, I, primarily what you would need to know to run your board and, and certainly for transparency of your board and commissions. So I am happy to answer any specific questions. I didn't know how much you wanted me to go into it. Um, Uh, I think this came about initially regarding just uh, the number of people, I think, um, well, a meeting to be held outside of ETAC, what would constitute then a meeting that obviously would have to be posted for the, for the community. So for example, you know, um, and I think it would, that was answered. Uh, mm -hmm. previous meetings as being three or more committee members and would officially be considered a meeting regardless of the location and would have to be uh, posted as such. I think that was one one issue that was clarified. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is if it's just a social gathering that's different but if any city business is being discussed then it would be classified as a meeting. If three or more regardless of where you are if you're discussing city business then yes that would be considered a meeting in a social gathering that is different um so that 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 i mean that is stipulated kind of on there but but really the biggest thing is just for the sake of transparency uh making sure that um if three or more members are together uh, we you want to make sure that you're not discussing any of the city business um outside of like a, a holiday party for this board and commission that type of thing so Understood. Yeah. Uh, I had just a question for you. This wasn't, this just come up recently for myself, but say for example, if 
I receive a correspondence from a citizen in the community and they have several questions. Um, so I, I'm bringing these uh, to light at our ETAC meeting. Do mm -hmm. I need to identify the person that communicated to me or is that is that required or not? So it's, it's not required. What I think is the best um, best practice certainly for this um, is that each committee member um, shares the information. So I think best practices is that if you as chairman are receiving correspondence, you want to get that to the staff liaison, which is Lorraine, and then she can disseminate it to the whole group. Um, so you want to make sure that everybody's working from the same information. If it's some mm -hmm. someone that doesn't want their name disclosed, then yeah, we can re you can redact that information. But you want to make sure that all of the board members have the same information. Um, so just making it a right. best practice that if you're corresponding with someone, uh, you want to make sure the whole group is included. Now, it's really important that you aren't sending those emails out um, between board members because then that ultimately will constitute a meeting. Mm -hmm. So the best practice is to send any type of correspondence that needs to go out to the whole group to the staff liaison who would then facilitate those that messaging, if that makes sense. It does, yeah, right. So yeah, that, that works for me there, Stephanie. So. Yeah, I was just curious because it's it's sometimes it, it becomes uh, a little different when, of course, it, it, in regards to time. So, for example, if someone reached out to me a week or so ago, I have that opportunity to go ahead and forward that information on to Lorraine or the city. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, and just for example, with uh, Mr. Sanders, who was previously on the line, he just reached out to me yesterday. I didn't have the opportunity to send that out, but I invited him to, to speak to the group, to the committee this evening. So perfect. Um, yep. But yeah, yeah, I think I think just if you keep in mind doing uh, doing business um, and considering it as a body of, you know, as a body of board versus individually, because if every board member is out kind of sort of conducting business on behalf of, of this board and commission. I mean, it, it just, I think just always keeping in mind that it's a, it's a body of however many are part of your group. So just keeping everybody in the loop um, and then certainly making those decisions in a public session and um, making, you know, the minutes available, that type of thing. So keeping all decision and um, decision-making uh, very formal uh, but certainly if you're gathering information and that type of thing, just making sure that every commission member has the information. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, very good. Uh, was there anything else from the, from the committee? Any other questions for Stephanie? Yes, I've, I've got one real quick. I apologize, the printer just started. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, earlier we were talking about uh, vote counts on our minutes. Um, yes. Is there a requirement that we have that or are there any restrictions that we have from including that information in our minutes? Well, interestingly, I um, I need to go and research that a little bit because I um, I run city council, and so of course everything that we do is notated by who motioned and who seconded and who voted how. Um, boards and commissions are a little bit um, new. We recently took over the board and commission coordination for the city, and so I am still familiarizing myself with all of the nuances of the different boards and commissions. So I am happy to really look into that because um, I need to go back and research previous minutes. I wanna just run it past our city attorney's office as well. But I mean, I think that the minutes reflect that there was a motion, what the motion was and that whether it was you know passed or defeated. So I think that's the key ingredients that you already currently do. Um, I just, I, I do wanna just look into that and just make sure um, that an actual recorded vote doesn't need to be taken. So I'll get back to you, um, to you all on that. Okay, yeah, I appreciate you looking into that. I know ETAC doesn't have, I don't believe we have like binding authority 
for making commitments on the city's behalf in this committee, whereas maybe some other ones do. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were different rules around that. Yeah, but, but that's uh, the hard part is um, a lot of the boards and commissions have, are run differently or ha they have different bylaws or different sets of the way that they run their meetings. And, and that is one of the goals. Certainly we wanna be a resource for all the boards and commissions. We are, like I said, we just recently took this over and we, we wanna revamp up some of the training and the, some of the tools that'll be available to you as board members. Um, and certainly for the chairman of how to run meetings effectively, but then also just to make sure that we create a consistency between the boards and commissions. So that is a big project that we've recently taken on. Um, this handbook is one thing that it was passed a while ago, but it, we, nobody really ever did anything with it. So we're really tackling this handbook um, first and foremost. So at some point, we'd love for you all to kind of look through it and if there's any suggested changes you want to make. But again, we, we hope to kind of lock arms with all of you and ha help the staff liaisons a lot more of, of just effective meetings and how to do the best that you can um, in in the most efficient time that you can. All right, thanks. Well, that uh, answers my question, I guess. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> until we hear back. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, Maria, yeah, did, is there anything um, else you want to make? Apologize, cover? everybody. I was. I might be having the same service. I don't believe so. I'll ask the question though for the committee. Anything else for Stephanie? Well, I just want to thank you all for um, the time that you, you know, just the service to your community. I'm an Inglewood resident as well. And um, so I just want to thank you for your service. And also just uh, you're being very good sports of adopting this new protocol of virtual meetings. Um, you're doing a great job. I know there's always some technical challenges along with that, but it's, it's nice to know that we were able to get boards and commissions back up and running um, kind of despite some of the circumstances. So um, again, we're just a resource for your board. If you have any questions or if you need us to do anything for you, just let us know. Okay, bye. <laughs> okay, thank you, Stephanie. All right, thanks. Um, okay, very good. On to the next agenda item here. I'm gonna go back here, let's see here. Okay, all under that item right there, and Stephanie addressed that, so I think we're good to move on to the next agenda item. And that would be approval of modified bylaws note, ETAC bylaws memo. So the Inglewood Transportation Advisory Committee ETAC bylaws were adopted by the commission at the July 2020 meeting. Unfortunately, the version that was presented to the committee included a term of three years for members. In fact, per the municipal code, the term length for an established commission is four years. Therefore, staff is recommending that the commission approve the revised bylaws with this change. Did I get cut off? We, I think we can still hear you though now. Okay, sorry if I'm, I'm having the same technical. Okay. <laughs> I think I've got the same service that the guy does because we're both experiencing some issues here, so. 
So, uh, but I was reading the um, that agenda item right there. So I don't know if you guys had an opportunity to uh, to uh, read along with that. So I'm going to try to modify, or I'm sorry, share the screen again here to that. Let's go again. Yeah, okay. so I think the was the basically the change here was they our previous bylaws had a three year term for um, all the members and the updated handbook and, and guidance is four years uh, per term. And I think that was a suggested change. And I don't believe there was anything else um, uh, for the term length here. So I, I my only question with that was, um, well, I guess that would be like an effective immediately sort of thing. So would we have people on this committee that would then have extended terms? And would there be anything special we need to do around that situation? If I could answer, Chair, um, Stephanie already dropped off, but she was the one who actually noticed this. So everybody right now is on the current or the correct cycle. And so if you look further down through the memo, you'll see the current terms for everyone. And so they are, because um, they list both like the start date, start year and the when you would expire and they're all four year terms. So that's, I think we're correct as it is. And so the bylaws would just support that as we adopt them. So right now on my, on my screen, I'm showing under tenure article four tenure. I see where it's been crossed out from three to four years. If that, if you're, you're all seeing that as well too. Okay, great. Okay, very good. So, so this at this stage, this is just informational. This isn't anything obviously we have to vote on. It's just something that you've, you've provided us with some background on this and, and that it's been corrected, if you will, correct? No, we are asking for a formal action to approve this with those changes. Yes. Okay. Okay, well, um, um, Lorraine, I don't know if I'm looking at the most recent um, version of that, but when I scroll to the end, um, it doesn't look like the terms, um, when the terms expire, are correct on what I'm looking at. So, Member O'Connell, are you looking at the same thing that Neil has up on the screen, or are you talking about the attachment? Um, I'm, I think I'm looking at what Neil's looking at. Yep. Is there a, a page number that you're looking um, at? 63 is what I have, Greg. Page, yeah. Page 63 is what's shown here of 97 in terms of the whole agenda. I meant, uh, and Member O'Connell, which page is it that you see three years on? Um, I'm looking, well, um, just on the on the bylaws memo, um, it just, it's just page two. Hmm. It's what's showing on the screen right now. Because um, at the bottom of this page, um, Neil, there is a section where it says term colon, and then I see four years there. Just like, yeah, just like that. Right there, yeah. Okay. So we'll go ahead and work with the um, city clerk's office to make to make that correction. Well, we're trying to make it, the suggestion here is to make it four years. So um, I motion to accept the proposed change from three to four years as indicated on this document. Any second? I second that motion. And so was there any further conversation on this discussion regarding that? Three or four years? I believe if we update the section um, whatever page that is that has the terms. Uh, article four. 
uh, then we probably don't need to make the adjustment at the bottom of the document. Uh, but I would want to check and make sure that everybody's terms are appropriately amended or adjusted uh, if this is approved. And and I chair, think if I, chair, if I could, oh, um, right. Member O'Connell, are you saying that yours should be four? Because you were a fill-in for somebody who dropped off. So you would have a two-year term and then you would need to be reappointed in 2022 and then you would have a four-year term. So you were finishing somebody's uh, term who had fallen off and were oh. elected as a new member. That's why you oh. show two. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. So. Yep. Sorry about that. Sorry about the confusion, but that's, yeah, that's why you are. And there's a paragraph in there right where it says four, where we had the cross off of four years. So you, we want those staggered. So we don't want everybody, you know, getting off the commission at the same time. So there's some um, carryover in terms of membership. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that explanation there, Maria. So yeah, yeah. Because that was that was a bit confusing as well to me when I first joined the committee to understand, especially at the time I think I was the alternate member, and then once I became part of the committee itself and understanding that progression in terms of the terms as well, it could be a little confusing. So, um, I know we're supposed to be focused on the motion at hand, uh, but it does look like there's some inconsistency with the um, identification of a district uh, in that same section as well. Some people, I mean, mine's got it, it's listed on a couple others, but um, a couple of the other members don't have even the word district listed with their name. Um, so I am curious if there's a purpose for that on there or if maybe we should amend the motion to include or remove that for consistency. And, and uh, Member Diedrich, the, that sheet that you're seeing that's on the screen right now is not part of the bylaws. This is something that the clerk's office publishes, but we can certainly go ahead and add the districts based on your addresses. And yeah, as you see there, Member Canadison, we don't even have district, but we'll, we'll add that in and then ask the clerk to update the, this sheet on the city's website. Okay. But uh, technically you don't have to act on this document. Back to the motion at hand. Okay. Very good. So at this point, the motion uh, is still up for discussion. If there's anything else to add? Okay. Okay. I will take it for a vote then. So to vote on updating the bylaws from the three years to four years, Chris, you want to go ahead and, and put your, your language to it exactly as you wish? Uh, yeah, the motion is to accept the suggested change as presented in the updated bylaws from the memo from Maria on October 8th. Very good. Okay. And okay. that and that is for Article Four adjusting the term from three to of four years. Tenure. Excellent. Very good. Lorraine, if you want to take a vote. And to confirm, Chair Sarno, did you second that? I seconded that. Yes, I did. Okay. Chair Sarno? Aye. Member Dietrich? Aye. Member Kanadison? Um, District 2, aye. And Member O'Connell? Aye. Okay, very good. The ayes have it. Okay, thanks everyone. Let's move on to our next topic. Let's see here. And we're back to the organized garbage collection update. Click to that. 
uh, request for proposals for a potential from potential contractors to provide single source hauling disposal of garbage recycling and recycling was issued on June 11th. Two proposals were received on July 16, 2020. Citizens Committee created a list of questions for each firm to answer. Responses were received on September 28th and disseminated to the committee. The next committee will be held on, I'm sorry, committee meeting will be held on Monday, October 12th to discuss administrative procedures. Um, this is a continuation, correct, uh, Director Andrea, of, of this item that's been for some time. And I don't know, I guess from the last time to this, we the city's received, I guess, uh, responses, or the Citizens Committee has, um, from the two, pro two um, proposals. And uh, the meeting will be held on October 12th. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Nothing at this time. Yeah, it's been kind of a kind of a slow month. So we we've, there's 11 members on the committee. So it's been challenging to find a date that works for the majority of folks. So we haven't had a meeting since um, I believe it was September 3rd. So the next one that we were able to schedule is on October 12th. So it's been quite a while. And then as it says there, um, we are going to be discussing just some of the administrative procedures around how the committee works and and forms and um, we did elect a chair and a vice chair at the last meeting as well. So that was good progress. Okay, great. So this, this will continue this process obviously and you'll just continue to us as we, as we go along each month. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great, yeah. Okay. Anything else from the group regarding organized garbage and recycling? The initiative at this time. Okay, we'll just keep this going here. And we're on to new business. So we've got Unified Development Code Assessment. We have presenters joining us today. Wade Burkholder from the Planning, Ma Planning Manager and Jennifer Gardner and Logan Sipson. And we have a UDC presentation. So they're on the line. I'll let them go ahead and take it from here. Let yeah. me know if I can help out in terms of just scrolling through or how you guys would like to approach this. I think or if you could, you yeah, could share think, as well too. Yeah, I think we may go ahead and share the, the screen on our end so we can flip through uh, the slides as we need to. But uh, good evening, everybody, uh, Chair Sarno and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the time tonight that you've allotted for us to talk about this project. Uh, as mentioned, I am Wade Burkholder. I'm the planning manager in the community development department of the city. And one of the primary uh, functions of, of the, the area that I manage in community development deals with the unified development code uh, the interpretation and application of that code uh, in, in, in many different scenarios. Uh, the Unified Development Code um, is a very large document, some 300 pages or so, and it really um, can also be referred to as our zoning code. So, you know, you'll, you'll hear a lot of different um, terminology when we talk about the Unified Development Code. Uh, but it's essentially a zoning code. Um, if any of you have ever built a new house or built a new garage or a patio, you know, this code is going to uh, tell you how tall you can build the structure, how close to the property lines you can build, what your setbacks are, how much of your lot you can cover. Uh, but it also talks about number of parking spaces you need uh, for retail, for office uses, uh, it goes and describes in detail all of the zoning districts that are found within the city. So, you know, R2B, R2A, uh, you know, those are typically duplex zonings with the two identified. You can have two structures on your lot if your lot's big enough. So it talks about a lot of different sort of development guidelines. So after that sort of long-winded explanation, uh, we are beginning to update um, the Unified Development Code. 
it's been since 2004 since this code has been uh, thoroughly looked at. Now, over the years, the city has done a lot of uh, piecemeal uh, modifications to that code. Uh, for example, you all may remember the short-term rental discussion that happened last year or the accessory dwelling unit uh, ADU ordinance the city council passed about two years ago. So there have been intermittent uh, amendments to the code, but looking at it holistically has been since 2004. And as um, there's been a couple comments tonight, the city has changed dramatically in the last uh, 16 years. And so a lot of our codes that we currently have are outdated. Um, we're missing a lot of things uh, in our code that, uh, you know, with, with changes in, in construction techniques and, and so forth, you know, our code just isn't keeping up with, with the metro area and the actual community itself. Um, I wanna introduce uh, Jen Gardner. Uh, Jen Gardner is with Logan Simpson, um, and they are uh, helping us uh, with this project. The first phase of the project really is community input. We're listening to the community. We're also going to the boards and commissions of the city and sort of introducing this project. And we want to make sure, you know, as we move forward, we hear your thoughts on some of the things that are working or not working, what you would like to see, maybe tweaked in the neighborhoods or in the commercial district. So that said, I wanna turn it over to Jen Gardner who will walk us through uh, the, the bulk of the presentation tonight. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Wade. And thank you committee members for having us tonight. Um, Neil, it does look like you're still sharing your screen. Did you right. want to, I, I could, if you back up a little bit, wait, where are you right now? Sorry, you're in the right spot. Uh, I'll just have you ad advance it as we go, so. Yeah, and that, that works either way. Sounds good, Perfect. Jen. Perfect. You've already got it up, so let's roll with it. So okay, go great. To the next slide, please. Sure. Um, so as Wade already gave you kind of a, a pretty good project overview, I'll go into a little bit more detail on how we're tackling the project and what outcomes we perceive. Um, then we're going to do a little exercise with you guys. So um, ask you some questions and then I can go over some next steps that are coming up. So next slide. Well, while that's working and, and one more slide, sorry. Okay. Um, so the um, primary purpose of this document or this um, effort is, um, as Wade said, to bring bring the code up to up to current standards. Um, it's also to take a look at all the core guiding documents, such as the uh, comprehensive plan, transportation plan, parks and recreation master plan, downtown plan. Um, we comb through all of those documents to um, pull out any policies or strategies that are related to um, zoning or land development, make sure that those are getting uh, addressed with the code. Um, and we also want to make sure that the code is congruent with community goals and values. So that's the, the key component of our reaching out to committee, committee members, community members, um, and so forth to, to really ensure that the code is, is keeping up with community values. Next slide, please. And our, our process is, is a three-step process. So we review the Unified Development Code or Title 16 of the Municipal Code, the Zoning Code, all the same thing. Um, we're doing a deep, 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 you know, line-by-line -line review of the code um, and reviewing all the core policy documents, like I said, for any, any guidance um, that needs to be incorporated in the Unified Development Code. Um, Step two, or really part of step one, is listening to the communities um, to, to assess the goals and values. Um, and then step three is to synthesize uh, both of those first two steps into um, a recommendations report for the for city staff. Um, that recommendations document will include any, any and all recommendations we have for um, even, the, you know, even if it's just a tiny little tweak to some language, you need to change this number from three to four those types of things. We're just gonna have it all in a report for staff. 
Um, and that will help them decide which, um, which elements of, of that they want to move forward um, with for a code update, possibly starting next year. Next slide, please. And while I'm waiting for the next slide, I mean, a piece of that could be that the code is fantastic and there needs to be no update. That could be the recommendation. As of now, I will tell you, there are a lot of little things that do need to be adjusted to bring it up to, up to standards. So um, some of the potential outcomes of our assessment um, could be uh, recommendations to change dimensional regulations to align with neighborhood character. Um, could be parking regulations. We've talked actually a lot about parking and walkability with a lot of community members. Um, could be to incorporate some more sustainability, uh, green infrastructure type guidelines or, or regulations. Um, and anything that might help housing, provide more housing opportunities and diversity to accommodate a range of incomes and um, people of all, all walks of life. Next slide, please. And those are just some, some general outcomes that could, could come out of this just to give you kind of a, a feel. So next slide, please. We always throw in these little cover slides for ourselves and then. Sure. Um, so for the outreach so far, we had, a, we kicked everything off with a telephone town hall. Gosh, that was probably early September now, um, followed very closely by an online questionnaire. Um, and then we held uh, focus group meetings for a week. Uh, we met with about 60 attendees over three days. Um, we have held open houses in parks around the community. So we had five different open houses over the last three or four weeks. Um, we did a joint work session with planning and zoning and city council at the beginning of the project to kind of hear their thoughts. And um, we have met with our, our steering committee, I believe two different times now. Um, and next slide, please. And our steering committee is, is made up of planning and zoning commission members and community members that are helping us um, just kind of provide a sounding board to some of the ideas that we're, we're mulling around. Um, so part of that initial questionnaire that we pushed out, we got 693 responses. And the reason we have in the parentheses complete and partial is just to, to point out that we had about 313 people complete the entire survey and about 380 people, you, there's not, not all the questions are required. So some people pick and choose a few questions that relate to them and that's completely fine. So 88% um, of those respondents were residents. So that's great. We heard some um, heard from some community members who work in the community or live in surrounding communities, which is also kind of helpful. Um, we've heard from citizens, architects, business owners, developers, staff and the design review team um, Historic Preservation Commission. Um, we're meeting with you guys tonight. We have some meetings next week with the Board of a Appeals and uh, one other group. So we're trying to get out to, to everybody and really hear what, what's working and what's not with the code from your perspective. Next slide, please. I'm going to go through just a real high level of what we've heard out of all this outreach to kind of help guide um, our conversation this evening. So about 50% of the people that took our questionnaire were familiar with the code. Um, not surprising. I mean, actually that was a pretty high number. Um, as you guys know, I mean, and as Wade mentioned, the, the zoning code is a large document and a lot of people don't get into it unless you have a, a, a need, you know, if you're developing or you wanna build an a, a accessory dwelling unit, um, there's, those are kind of the main reasons that any, you know, a general member of the general public might get into the zoning code. Um, or offense or those types of things. Um, there was a real split response on whether the code is adequately implementing community values and goals. We had a couple of questions on that topic. Um, one of the questions, the response was that we are, um, or that the code does implement the goals and values. And the other question kind of led us to believe that it was not addressing the goals and values. So that led me to believe we're kind of on the fence as to whether we think that's happening. Um, and most respondents have not taken an application through the city. So um, that's just an interesting uh, note there. Uh, next slide, please.
And um, what we've heard, so these are probably the top five topics that we've heard about. Um, I'm going to probably add a sixth in as I'm talking because we've been hearing more recently about a, a sixth topic, but um, we've heard a lot about ADUs, which, which are accessory dwelling units. Um, we've heard a lot about, um, so as Wade and I have talked, there's been several applications that have come through the city, but they haven't actually um, come to fruition. And so we're looking at, is that um, a size issue? Is it a dimensional standard? Is it a setback? Is it um, attached versus detached? Those types of things. Um, and we are hearing that a, a lot of people are are saying that they need to be allowed in, I think is it R1A zone, it's a larger lot zone, so um, which they're not allowed in now. Um, and uh, we have heard a little bit about the dimensional standards and size. Uh, parking standards, we've heard a lot about parking. Um, so we are looking very deeply into the specific situations and proposing some alternative um, approaches to parking. Um, We've heard a lot about a focus on walkability and sustainability. And initially, we were hearing a lot about the walkability side. More recently, we've heard a lot more about the sustainability side, green infrastructure, stormwater management, that type of thing. So we're kind of pairing that in. That's like the new topic that's kind of getting rolled in. Um, we've heard quite a bit on revising home occupation allowance. Um, most of that is in light of COVID and people you know, working from home and if you are just, an, you know, work for an office and you don't need to bring people into your home, you're absolutely allowed to do that. But there's other professions such as hair, um, hairstylists or nails or um, lawyers, uh, attorneys, um, a lot of those type of professions that might only have one person at a time coming into their business. And if their business is out of the home, it's, it's not allowed right now. So we're looking into that. Um, and then We've heard a lot on the, um, the duplexes, um, the infill development in the kind of the northern portion of the community. It's an R2 zone, so it is allowed, um, but we're just kind of taking a look at what, what are the issues and how can we um, affect change in that area. So that is mainly what we've heard. If you go ahead, two more slides. Um, we have some questions for you guys tonight. And you can think about these kind of topics as you're answering those questions as well. Um, but basically our, our five questions tonight are what's working with the code? What's not working with the code? Um, are the application processes meeting the needs of staff in the development community? Are there any specific design standards that need to be tuned up? And are there any topic standards or innovations that are missing from the current code? And you don't have to answer them in any particular order. If you have any thoughts on any of these topics or those kind of five or six main topics that have surfaced, um, we'd love to hear your feedback. So I'm going to open the floor for discussion now. Um, I have a thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I look at um, the sea of parking around um, the city government building with um, a lot of the big box stores, it makes me think that parking minimums aren't working very well. Okay. Good. Anything else on parking? Or anything else you want to weigh in on, Tiffany? Um, that's the big one for me. I, I think about it a lot. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, I think I've I've shared my comments in a survey um, okay. about this, and and so yeah. like I said, I rely mostly on my feedback there being counted. But I I just I think that you know the city has transitioned several times in its um, roughly hundred year history, and we're in another period of transition. You know, our our population has been pretty stable at about thirty thousand people for a pretty long time, and the city of Denver is generally getting uh, the the Denver metro area is generally getting more dense, and I think that Inglewood should move along with that uh, towards more dense uses of our space. Um, and that I think that as those dense uses come along, that it can help be helpful to the city in a lot of different ways with sustainability, walkability, um, improving our sales tax base, uh, having more people who live closer to where they work, a lot of those different kinds of problems that are identified in just general citizen surveys. Um, and then I just really want to um, like, 
say thank you to member O'Connell. That's a, a pain point in my mind every time that I see all those empty parking spots um, and think about all of what, how many people who can't afford a house or who are being squeezed by the affordability of their housing and how that those parking spots could be better allocated towards apartment buildings or some, some other use. Thank you, that was great, thanks. I've got a few thoughts uh, for you and, and a few questions as well. Um, you know, with uh, your list, I, I didn't necessarily prep things before, but uh, you know, I echo um, Tiffany and Greg's thoughts on, on what's not working um, as well right now. Uh, you know, some general stuff, we're seeing density increase to, to Greg's point, um, sort of that general trend. Uh, also these trends towards sort of the transit oriented development uh, and so along with those trends and, and things that we're seeing in the community and some of the feedback we're hearing, um, you know, I, I want to make sure we're addressing sort of mixed use uh, buildings in the right areas, as well as sort of pedestrian focused. Uh, Inglewood, uh, while, while it's not well known as a, a transportation hub in the area, it really is. We've got lots of main thoroughfares coming through, uh, really good public transportation options. And, and I think that those are a little bit underutilized in the in the um, community as well. So, you know, if there are things that we can do to um, allow for either easier access or ways that we can sort of guide development to take advantage of those great public transit infrastructure things that we already have in place uh, would be great. Um, you know, the a multimodal focus uh, would be wonderful. We've had quite a few studies done in the city in the last five or six years around, um, you know, trans transportation studies in particular, and, and also some uh, just greater city planning. And, and several of them was sort of pointed to the same sort of design solutions and, and problems that have been in the community. And, and I think those would be a great resource if I'm, I, I really hope you're using them. I, I'm going to assume you're looking at them, but I just wanted to bring them up uh, because, you know, they've, there have been some really common themes in those documents that I would love to see incorporated into sort of the um, model code and uh, uniform development um, code in general, uh, which, you know, there, there are some things that are bigger, longer term type improvements. Uh, there are some that are shorter term wins that the city's done really well recently, uh, you know, trying to tackle some of those. But I think with the UDC, we have an opportunity to really sort of point towards some of those solutions that might be more of the long term, bigger projects that we've had in the area. Uh, you know, specifically some of the things would be like, uh, you know, parking requirements in the transit oriented areas. Um, I, on your slide, you know, you mentioned contextual parking requirements and, uh, you know, there's probably several ways to handle addressing that, but uh, to, to the points that Tiffany and Greg made, um, you know, those giant parking lots right in the heart of the city center are in one of the most transit oriented areas frankly, in, in the metro area, really, with the buses and, and the free um, our bus we've got and the light rail and, and the major highways. And, and we've got to see a parking lot in that area. And a lot of studies have pointed to doing something other than those big box stores. So, uh, you know, there's other areas in town around the light rail stations and some of the heavier transit intersections as well that I would love to see sort of um, addressed at a, a broader level, uh, which would be the UDC. Um, I, you know, access to parks and public spaces is one of the things that we've heard quite a bit back uh, from the community, especially pedestrian access to those areas. Um, you know, from the UDC perspective, it's probably a, a little bit harder to <laughs> incorporate some of those things, but there are some opportunities, I think. And so, um, you know, access to the parks. We have several parks in Inglewood that run, uh, you know, through drainage areas or things like that, you know, low-lying areas where there might be a creek in the middle of it. But what happens there is they end up going across several blocks or they, they end up being a little bit fragmented and, and there are these great public spaces, but um, you know, it's not always easy, you know, parents with kids trying to cross one street to the next when they're going down the path. Um, some of those types of things, uh, if, if there's an opportunity for that as well, I think that would be really good for, you know, very, uh, an effect that would be felt on a very local neighborhood type of level, I think could be really good if, if there's an opportunity for that as well. Um, 
you know, we, you mentioned some of the the structural, both plain things, uh, short-term rentals, ADUs. Um, I'm, I'm glad the city is sort of moving in the direction with the density and incorporating some of those things. Um, personally, you know, I feel that there may be some things in place structurally that are preventing further utilization of those types of options in those areas. So when we're thinking about ADUs and short-term rentals, um, you know, you get into some of the smaller lot sizes, not not the single lots, but like lot and a half or single lots that might be able to have a smaller ADU on the back, but then they still have these residency requirements. But then we also have these different short-term rental types of situations. Um, a lot of these older houses, some of them have these basement apartments. And so I think we have an opportunity to look at, um, oh, the answer starting in. Uh, I, I think we have an opportunity to look at that and 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 see what's going to be sort of the best use moving forward. Um, not necessarily like easing all the restrictions on it, but uh, there's probably a little bit of easing in there or or some things that we can do that are going to make that type of thing make more sense. You know, uh, I know some people that live on some of those smaller lot lot and a half that uh, maybe they would be able to put an ADU in and better better utilize their space, but they might need to have uh, different situations that would help them make that affordable and able to have that extra housing available to other people. And so uh, there, some of the restrictions currently in place kind of prevent some of those things. So I, I definitely appreciate you guys taking a look at that and what some of the best practices are. It's only certain districts in the city um, I know there's a lot of people around who have been in their homes for a long time that we get some resistance from. There's also a lot of great new people moving into the community that might not have been able to afford something similar um, in other parts of town. And, and so, you know, there's both sides of the argument, but I'd be really curious to see what's sort of happening on a national level and, and what the, the trends are in that direction within those um, more densely zoned areas. Um, and, and another question I have, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here, but I was just curious, you know, um, we all on the committee hear from people in the community and, and we'll have feedback on these types of things. I know this is sort of like a point in time spot check on it, but is there, what's a good way also for us to continue to provide feedback as part of this process that maybe doesn't necessarily require you guys to come to one of these formal meetings that happen once a month? Mm -hmm. And I'll jump in, Jen, real quick. Um, you, you're always uh, more than welcome to email me or call me. Um, um, I know Director DeAndrea and, and Guy have those numbers, or they can email them out to all of you or however the best way to get, get all that information to you. But throughout this whole process and throughout the entire rewrite, you know, we'll, we'll want to we'll wanna still hear what you all have to say. So. You know, I, I'll be your contact at the city for for that. And um, yeah, please send me send me what you have, what's on your mind, and and we'll make sure we we get that incorporated or talk through it and and go from there. Great, thank you. Uh, that's all I had. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. That was a great list. Well, thanks. I. Um... I also agree with the, the sentiment of uh, my fellow committee members here as well, too. So on what they've brought about here, quite a bit of it. But I have a, a more specific question, and I guess this could be for you, Wade, uh, in regards to if, you know, there's been a lot of this, I think, and it's continuing here in, in the city in regards to what would be the typical scrapers, you know, that happen in the neighborhood there too. And I guess my question is, is that, is there a notification that's required to the surrounding homeowners or residents? Um, if, you know, someone purchases a home, whether it's a company or individual, and they intend to knock down that residence or the, the house and build something new, is there anything that that is, the city requires to inform the surrounding neighbors. I know in Denver they do, I think in, its, in terms of duration and so forth, the hours that they'll be working and the like. Can you uh, speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, city of Englewood does not have any notification requirements for demolitions um, at the moment. And I say at the moment because um, 
one of your one of your companion boards, the Historic Preservation Commission, is looking at making some recommendations to our demolition permit that we have at the city that that could potentially require notifications to happen. So it is it is being looked at right now, but as of today, at this point in time, we do not have anything. Okay. Um, Understood. So I, I think that's something that's come up a few times. So and it, I think it's it's coming closer to me. I know that certainly, but um, sure. you know, I, at the very least, in terms of construction and whether it's roadway or residential and the like, you know, you would think that that would be just a kind of a minimum baseline in terms of communicating to the people around, uh, at, sure. at least the most immediate neighbors that, hey, you know, this is going to be the work that's that's uh, proposed work. And at the very least, some of the hours, if, if you will, that, right. you know, they'll be working and so forth. Um, maybe a window of time on the anticipated construction, you know, window or calendar days or what have you there. But I think it just would set at ease a lot of people that, you know, if, if they don't necessarily want to go snooping around, but they just want to be informed from, what's happening right next door to them, uh, you know, especially when it comes to, you know, demolition and construction, we know that it's, it's always going to be a noisy process and the like. And right. so I, I think it would just help alleviate some of the, uh, some of the concerns that some of these people living right next door to somebody that's, that's having that happen would, it, it could, you know, it could clarify that and help them feel a little bit more comfortable with that. So. Absolutely. Very good point. Um, yep, we we will we will make note of that. Okay. Well, great. Um, okay. Well, uh, anything else from the group for Wade or for Jen? Okay. Um, thanks again for your time. Appreciate it very much. And. Um, I'll make sure I, we get you my contact info. Uh, thank you, Wade. Thanks, thanks, Jen, for the presentation. Yeah, thank You're you welcome. very much. All right, very good. Good night. Right, good thanks. night. Thanks. Okay, uh, moving on to the next agenda item. Okay, Windermere on street bike lanes. Okay, Inglewood and Littleton staff have been collaborating to potentially provide a protected bicycle lane on Windermere Street from Bellevue Avenue to Tufts Avenue. This would be Inglewood's first protected bicycle lane. Wow. Littleton has recently completed the design. See attached and is planning to install their portion this fall. Inglewood staff will seek concurrence from the adjacent property owners, ETAC and the city council prior to installation considering the time required to obtain concurrence and the effort required for signage fabrication and installation, Inglewood is currently targeting spring of 21 to install the segment of Layton Avenue. Costs estimated 15,000 would come from the 2021 walk and wheel implementation budget. Recommendation staff recommends that ETAC recommend installation of the on-street bike lanes project upon concurrence from the adjacent property owners and city council. Okay, very good. So we've got here some plan view. And I don't know for the group, if you guys have had time to digest this and take a look at this and what are your thoughts on this? Uh, it seems really exciting to me, um, you know, having protected bike lanes, I think is the ideal for, um, and it's, you know, I've, I've biked that road before it's been a while, but, um, I've biked it and there's certainly a ton of space there. So, um, it's great to see that it can get used like this. I, I did have one question about the north end of it at, um, at Tufts and whether I know that there's. Uh, I sort of have a vague awareness of a, um, I think it's called the rail trail project that would be over closer to the 
um, railroad right away. And I wonder whether the, so the um, design, as I saw, it looks like it curves more towards um, Tufts and then uh, Navajo. And I wonder whether there should be more of a sense that the bikes would connect over towards the Windermere that's by the railroad right away so that it can connect into the um, rail trail and then um, maybe into towards the, uh, that would give a better connection to the new proposed bridge at the Oxford Station Apartments. Okay. Let me, because I'm not sure, I'm kind of having my screen blocked here, Greg. I'm, I might switch to the Google <laughs> Earth view if that'll help out for everybody. Okay. Maybe while you do that, uh, Chair Sarno, if anybody, any city staff want to um, comment about that, like what are their thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it was stopped, uh, it was stopped at Tufts because that's where the bike lane, uh, the bike, the, the actual official regional bike route turns onto Tufts from Wigamere and Tufts. Uh, uh, the eventual, the rail trail will actually go all the way down to the uh, two past Layton uh, and connect to the park. So that'd be the official the future way to, uh, uh, way, to uh, way to connect it. So, but right now we're trying to serve uh, the kind of the goal of this one is to bring people to to the Tusk because that's a that's a designated bike route. Uh, if we did that when the rail trail gets built, um, it it could be done in phases, and it is. I do. I've actually looked up some phase and possibility that that connection at the other side of Tuff that you referred to might be a place where uh, it would tie a, a rail trail would tie in temporarily until the complete rail trail was built. But right now it's 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 being striped to. Uh, to connect to the uh, designated bike route of Tufts. And it, uh, there's not really enough room right now uh, to do any kind of bike lane protected all the way to Oxford because of the narrowness of Navajo in that area. Is that, is that shown on those plan sheets there, Guy? I can re return back to that. Not really. I mean, just it ends at Tufts uh, uh, okay. and the and the Tufts, the main part of Tufts that go, is east of, um, because of that, because we're, because that's that's where uh, I think it's called E7. It's L7 in Littleton, and then turns to E7. I think it's it might be nine, but I think it's seven. And there, at that's location where, where uh, the bike route actually, and net, and it's also now with the, uh, with the idea of where we're looking to do a you know a. A bike lane on Tufts, uh, that part of Tufts from from there to uh, Clarkson. That's, but yeah, I mean, definitely, like even uh, right now, for example, is I was talking to Littleton about doing some wayfinding, including at the dog park, which is right now where um, basically this bi uh, this bike lane would would tie into the Dry Creek Trail. So yeah, no, we're looking at things, but this is based on uh, existing and near-term infrastructure. Uh, at this point, the rail trail could be pretty far off. Yeah, and and I, I I guess I see now what you're saying that the the network goes both ways really at Windermere and Tufts. Like it, you know, the long-term network will go towards um, towards Tufts eastbound all the way over to Clarkson, and it, and it'll go sort of up towards that rail trail yeah. um, to the west. Yeah. Okay. That seems great. My, I guess my only other reaction was it's uh, $15,000 for 0.6 miles. That seems like we should do a lot more of that. <laughs> I'm curious with uh, the big dry creek rail, you know, the spike path is going to run right over it on, uh, you know, page two of the attachment. Um, it shows, you know, going across the road. Is there going to be any signs or is there any, I, I know this is sort of like the shorter term striping project that we're talking about here, but um, connecting that to the big dry creek trail with anything? 
Yeah, that's our attention working with the Littleton traffic engineer and his, and uh, he has a, uh, his designer put it together was to create, like I said, a wayfinding science. Mm -hmm. I, I talked about how even that, you know, we would maybe stick a wa wayfinding signs, you know, like at Tufts and Windermere, including like, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, a wayfinding sign could say, you know, uh, uh, one mile to Bellevue Park and then two miles to downtown Little Littleton, they're going to stick kind of wayfinding signs on their end, you know, maybe direct to anything we want them to direct them over here. And then we, like I said, at the dog park, the idea of that we would actually, uh, the interest to the dog park is basically the connection to Little Dry Creek. So the idea of putting away funds and kind of how things work, probably one would belong to Inglewood because we, we, we have, we are responsible for signs on what, and one would belong to Littleton. So we were talking about, that would be part of this initial site. Uh, my, the only couple, only a few signs really but uh, add in science, it just hasn't been developed yet. And that would be done in house. The 15,000 is just for the uh, estimate that uh, Littleton got for the striping of their our portion. Cause they actually have a contractor on board already for their portion. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's great. And I really appreciate you working with them. I know we kind of crossed to the edges of the districts in between um, at, at the bottom there. Uh, with respect to the actual big dry creek trail that runs along the creek, uh, you know, to connect a bike lane down to the creek would probably require a little bit of infrastructure change uh, and, and probably some signage too. Is there something like that in the in the longer term plan here? Not for this particular thing. Uh, like I said, if the 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 rail trouble connecting to Little Dry Creek and and. And the, I don't know if we're on the right page. Maybe you could go one more up. Uh, uh, the, is that, let, me know, let me know, Guy, if I'm on the right, or if yeah, it's showing up. It's, there's a little to, delay as well, too. Yeah. One more? Let's go one yeah. more. Yeah. Just, I think it's just the one more. Yeah. So one. right here, just south of, oh, not yet, too far. 82. Gotcha. I think I was on it, but then it's the delay. Yeah. There you go. Yep. So okay. that that road or uh, driveway just south on the east side is the dog park. And in that parking lot, there's a, con a connection to a little dry creek. So that's that would be the connection. Okay, so you'd want to route bikes through the parking lot down, and we, I guess, for that we would just need signage that says yeah. go this way. Uh, That's the what that what I'm referring to as the wayfinding near the dog park. It's signage for that. Okay. Thank you for clarifying, and I'm um, happy you guys are looking at that. Guy, you mentioned that Littleton already has a contractor on board for their section. Mm -hmm. It was just a, so it's it like a the, Say that one more time. I, I it didn't come through. It was just a. I mean, they have a contractor on board for some just striping, and this was included as part of the stripe a striping. It's a right. the contractor. I don't believe is just for for this. Actually, I think they have they have them on board to do. A, uh, you know, a stripe and maintenance job. I see. So is, is this something that the city is is bidding out for this work, or is this being done internally? It it would be through a contractor, most likely at this point. Like I said, they actually got a quote for us from the contractor they have on board. Gotcha. Okay. So there would be a probably considering the size of the quote, there'd probably be an opportunity not to do a full bid effort. We have it determine that yet we'd probably just do a, a kind of a a, a a quote and we would probably request a second quote right. so and eventually and that again quotes only good uh, the quote we have is you know for the current condition so we don't know the exact price once this is uh this is moved forward mm -hmm. okay 
well, I just, yeah, I support this and this project as well. It's, it's uh, another great one that I think the city's um, inputting here that I, I think is going to be an advantage for the community. It's very good. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else from the group on this item? Uh, I believe there was a request for us to make a motion uh, to recommend moving forward with this, uh, which I'm correct comfortable making. Um, well, I guess uh, before I make the motion, were there any potential amendments or anything that anybody would want to make to this uh, specifically? All right, well, I, I would like to motion, uh, well, here, let me make sure I appropriately. Uh, I'd motion that uh, ETAC recommends installation of the on-street bike lanes project uh, as presented uh, upon concurrence from the adjacent property owners and city council. Okay, very good. Do we have a second to that motion? I'll second. Okay, sorry if if I if there's a delay and I someone spoke up, I apologize. So I don't know if someone did or not. But okay, Greg, thanks. Um, but very good. Yeah, uh, we'll open it up for any additional conversation or discussion on this. I think we've shared our thoughts. None for me. Okay. Okay. Uh, Lorraine, let's move forward with a vote. Okay. Chair Sarno. Aye. Member Dietrich. Aye. Member Knatson. Aye. Member O'Connell. Aye. Very good. The ayes have it again. And so, yeah. Very good. I, I think uh, this is one of those projects that that ETAC really prides themselves in supporting in this regard. So I got to commend the city on the strides they're making for, for these types of projects, the bike lanes. And that's been communicated to me as well too from the general public as well. So thanks, Guy. All right, moving on to the next agenda item. And we've got 2021 transportation capital projects overview, capital improvements projects overview, 285 corridor, cra corridor crash, all revised. So I'm not certain who's going to be leading no, this one. I'll be doing that. Direct um, okay. Go ahead, and, Director. Yeah. So, um, and in the, the interest of time, there is no action required on this. So if you wanted to push it out for a future agenda item, we'd certainly be open to that. This was, I had put this on the agenda before we had the unified development code on there. So um, happy to go through it or put it on for a later date at your discretion. How do we feel about this? I. I personally have not had the opportunity to kind of look through here as closely as, as I have this last week here. So if, if we want to push it back, I'm okay with that as well too, but I'll defer to the group on this too, if you want to move forward. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, um, is, this is sort of an overview of what you guys are going to be doing next year. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Uh, I would be okay delaying this if there were other things that we thought were important. Uh, not that this is not, I think it's very important, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm okay with a delay till next meeting. There isn't anything, uh, Director D'Andrea, that we'd be missing, as you mentioned, by postponing this to the very next ETAC meeting, right? In terms of a recommendation or something that for, no, for what's so we, here. They, they had the first hearing of the um, 2021 budget with all the capital improvements on um, this past Monday on the 5th, 
The second reading would be October 19th. And so then the budget would become adopted. So this just reflects what's in the budget document. And we don't anticipate any changes between now and the 19th. Okay, great. Very good. So do we consist then from the committee? Do we want to uh, table this until the for our next November ETAC meeting and go through it at that time? I don't know if we have to formally vote on this, but if you just, just like to. Yeah, know, I think if you just speak up to choose that. to tape, table it um, would be fine. OK. I'm Great. okay with that. I'm happy to see a lot of things we've talked about in the last year and a half on here. It makes me smile. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Okay, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Citizen inquiry, bike progress memo. Um, I'll read through this real quick here. So uh, this memo is a response to recent citizen inquiries and input on bicycle improvements as the city of Inglewood develops a bicycle network as part of the transportation infrastructure, the walk and wheel plan and other such visioning documents will provide the primary guidance to the public work staff. Use of bike lane versus other approaches. Staff concurs, sharrows have limited effectiveness and intend to steer away from the, this approach in the future following neighborhood cities like Denver and Littleton Many Inglewood streets, including existing planned bicycle routes on Clarkson and Bates are approximately 30 feet wide, which would not allow room for bicycle lanes, even with the removal of parking. Thus, the walk and wheel plan designated these corridors as future improved bikeways. These improved bikeway, bikeways would implement traffic calming to induce lower speeds for the shared facilities. Traffic engineering intends to evaluate opportunities to implement traffic calming for the Clarkson bikeway in conjunction with the upcoming street work scheduled for 2022. Bellevue and Clarkson, this is a CDOT signal that is maintained by Inglewood staff, concurs that this is a reasonable location for bicycle detection and the city will perform an upgrade when budget allows. A crosswalk on the west side of the intersection would only be appropriate if there is a corresponding sidewalk path. Inglewood would work with Greenwood Village if when they decide to add their city's sidewalk infrastructure. Coordination with other cities, Traffic engineers coordinating with the following cities, Denver, Sheridan, and Littleton, and on multimodal projects. This currently includes bicycle lanes on Zunai, Lowell, Dartmouth, and Windermere. As Inglewood continues to build the city's multimodal network, traffic engineer will consider the best opportunities to develop a city night where citywide network based on previous visioning efforts, such as the walk and wheel plan. So, and this is from you guys. So this is regarding the citizen request that I had sent over and I, I had sent that to the group. Uh, I think it was a, at least a week or two ago and uh, uh, to address that. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, I think you pretty much hit on each bullet point that was brought up in that citizens request there guy uh, with that. So I appreciate you for responding to that. I would actually, I would have to say that for the Bellevue and Clarkson, um, traveling that traveling on Clarkson, of course, and at that intersection, trying to get south towards what would be um, Sunset Circle, I think, which is in Greenwood Village, but takes off into uh, the Highline Canal there as a cyclist. So going back and forth there, that, that intersection there, I've had this happen to me at least once or twice to where, um, you know, there's no cars at the intersection there. I'm sitting there as a cyclist and waiting for that, waiting for that light to come and it, it doesn't come or you have to cycle through at least a couple times or what have you there. So I can speak to that one myself that I, I've experienced that uh, on my own there, but I think this is a, a very good response and, um, and certainly we'll, we'll be in contact with that, with the citizen who requested this to uh, for her to see this as well, too. So, yeah. Hey, Neil, this is Chris. I'll take a look at that detection. Um, I could get something to work there in the meantime. We have some video cameras up there. Uh, that'd, be, that'd be cool. Uh, very cool, Chris. 
yeah um because it is it's it's just an annoyance you know just to be sitting there and of course and then you know some some cyclists they get a little antsy and they might want to just try to cross bellevue at that point you know and it's uh, you, you just gotta keep your eyes peeled and make sure you got enough sight distance and all that of clearing but it would be helpful there to kind of uh be able to look into that sure and and that was the intent for chris to do it in-house i just didn't want to put a schedule or budget on, on without reviewing it so it could happen pretty soon it just depends on availability all right well, very good yeah yeah i i know the other question too was regarding uh, coordination between the city and other municipalities uh, I think the question was specifically, if I recall, about on Yale. And um, if I recall that Denver is in, uh, doing a bike plane there or doing some improvements there as well, whether, um, whether the city was in coordination with Denver for that, for that section. Yeah, I mean, we would coordinate with them. Uh, the bike lane I'm aware of is actually uh, east of Franklin. Matter of fact, honestly, I'm not uh, yell. I mean, not every street is going to be designated bike lane, and I'm not really certain that the either Inglewood or uh, Denver is really focusing on a bike lane on Yale right now. It's very narrow, and it's still a collector, so mm -hmm. it's, it hasn't really been. And like, kind of as we refer to the fact. You know, kind of referring back to the walk and wheel plan. It's not really in the walk and wheel plan. Doesn't mean we can't ever do anything in the walk and wheel plan, but we are. Right. We're going to guide that. And it, there is, there was actually a, uh, um, they did a study, kind of a, a corridor study, which I think focused, I was, I actually, we had something else involved, but uh, which they invited us into. But that was actually mainly, um, uh, that was mainly uh, uh, east of Franklin. Because I, that will be something in the future we'll probably be coordinating with, is also Franklin, because uh, that is definitely a vision. I don't, not really sure if it's, in, it's very spelled in the walking wheel, but it's a vision in Denver, and honestly, it'd make a lot of sense to uh, 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 for us to work with them in the future, even maybe extend it into the Engle, the full Inglewood portion. And there's others right. like it's like like in here. There's and but but Yell isn't really on the radar it's not really been prioritized and like i said not every uh street will be uh will be assigned as a bike lane uh in the future i mean we can discuss like you know obviously you've seen some recent grant and uh, proposals and kind of prioritizing but you know what's even the next step after that because i mean the walk and wheel would probably be done in multiple layers like we got phase one done and then a massive phase two we're trying to get done and then there'd be phase three and four and maybe i mean the, in the future the group could talk about you know what they think would be the best part of like the next phase like which one's out of the plan right okay yeah and i appreciate your clarification to their guy on the uh, share rows as well too so understanding that you know we're kind of limited in terms of you know just the width of the roadways themselves and that determines what we can make possible there whether it's share roads or protected bike lanes and the like yeah so okay very good um anything else from the group regarding this topic Okay, Come back and okay, we're at the director's choice. So Director D'Andrea, do you want to go ahead and give us anything else you've got there? Yeah, nothing else for tonight, but happy okay. to answer any questions. Very good, thanks. Um, okay, uh, we can move, I guess, then also to Guy, do you want to go ahead and speak? Anything else you got there? No, I'm good. Okay. Chris Groth? 
I'm good. Thank you, though. You're good. All righty. And let's see here. We should also have Mayor Pro Tem Sierra on the line with us. He's still there. I am here, Neil. Uh, yeah, just one thing. I guess I just wanted to provide All an right. update. That if you can hear me, the traffic code is going to be coming in front of council for first reading on Monday the 19th. So we're about a, about 10 days away from that. Okay, Monday the 19th. Thanks for the notification there, Mayor Pro Tem. Appreciate Not that. Not a problem. Anything else? That is it. Okay. Um, I don't think we have Sergeant McKay with us, correct? On the line with us, so, okay. Lorraine, anything from you? you good? No, thank you, Neil. Okay. Uh, moving on to chairperson's choice. So I would just like to say thank you for the um, notification as well as the work that's being done in the alleys. Um, pretty much within the last week or so, I've noticed it all around um, in, in, our, in our neighborhood over here. And I noticed that there's been quite a bit of attention to drainage as well too, when they're grading that I've noticed there too, trying to convey a, a V shape there too, and to get you know, water out to, the, out to the curb, out to the streets and have it go to the right places. So um, just wanna just say that I noted that. And, and, and really I think the city has just overall stepped up, not only the work being done, but um, notifications as well too. Uh, through different avenues, whether it's putting street signs out or, you know, putting flyers on doors. So I think all of that has really come around and it's uh, been very helpful to keep, keep people notified and, 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 and have them happy about the work that's being done. So we appreciate that. Uh, that's all I've got there for chairperson's choice. Let's move on to committee members choice. Uh, we can start off with Tiffany. Um, I do have one thing. Um, I know in Denver, they have an ordinance that makes it illegal to park in the bike lane. Um, and I was speaking with an Inglewood police officer earlier this week about a, a situation where a guy is consistently parked in the bike lane on Dartmouth. And he told me that it wasn't um, against the law. So that might be something we should look into. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The, Interesting. It, that, that is interesting, but I'm glad you brought it up um, to uh, chair, uh, member O'Connell, excuse me. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll definitely look into that because that doesn't sound right, but. Yeah, he said, you know, that they weren't part, you know, they were parked close enough to the curb and they weren't blocking a driveway or anything. And mm -hmm. so technically mm. it wasn't illegal, mm. so. Okay, good, good I, question. I, I think it doesn't sound right for a typical bike lane, but the way this bike lane uh, is striped, it's a shared use uh, approach. So there probably is a legal issue, even because it's the dash indicates that it's a shared, a shared use issue. So, I mean, maybe we need to clarify whether typically parking in a bike lane, that should seems like it should be illegal, but because of how we dashed, how it's currently dashed, that could be, I think that could be a legal issue, even if parking in a bike lane is, is illegal. But the fact that we have, uh, because of the narrowness, we had that shared use thing that can be, that probably would create a gray area, even if the code does cover parking in a bike lane, a typical bike lane. And just to that note, we, we I think we will be looking in the future of dealing with that issue on Dartmouth about changing that, uh, changing that current design. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Can you can you uh, get back to us on that guy, and uh, just let us know on that? I was curious about that as well too, because I think I've seen occasionally a few vehicles parked on there on on Dartmouth. Is that right, Tiffany? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's the way it's striped. It 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 it, it, it probably leaves a legal gray area. I mean, that, I don't even know if the, uh, I don't even know what the, the code covers, whether you could park in a, a typical bike lane, 
but uh, it seems like it should cover that. But the fact, I mean, it was kind of, honestly, it was kind of designed that way to allow for some, uh, 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 some, uh, kind of some gray area, honestly. I, uh, this was before I was here because the parking lanes are pretty narrow along. You know, I'm curious though, Guy, if, it, if, you know, for example, isn't it, I think 18 inches from the curb is what a vehicle needs to be, um, is the maximum that it's allowed for a vehicle to be uh, away from the curb somewhere about there. Maybe I'm off with that. So that would, so if, if, a, if a, car, a car or a vehicle is parked and say if they're two foot and encroaching into the bike lane, I would think at that point, uh, you know, that would be a violation right there. Yeah, the situation here, Neil, is it's a, a pickup truck, which is fine. It fits in its parking uh, lane, but then he has a like a big utility trailer and it's the trailer that uh, is super wide and I totally see. blocks the bike lane. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, guy, yeah, just if you can just um, give us a little bit more background on that, the legality of it and whether that's that gray area you're referring to in terms of having that the dash striping there. Okay. Anything else, Tiffany? Nope, that's it. Okay. Uh Let's move on to Greg. Nothing from me. Thank you. All right, Greg. Chris? Yeah, you know, I got a couple of things I wanted to bring up real quick at the end here. I alluded to <laughs> sure. at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I'll, I'll be very brief, though. Um, one thing I noticed, um, just because I commute every, almost every day, um, Santa Fe to Dartmouth heading eastbound, uh, I, it seems like the light at what is that, the first intersection there that you run into. Um, I apologize, I should have this pulled up. Inca, the light at Inca, uh, it seems like the yellow is pretty short on that heading eastbound, and I guess westbound for that matter. Um, for the east and westbound traffic, I, I don't know if you guys can just kind of take a look at that or how you study it or whatnot, but it feels like it's been a little shorter, I've noticed. Um, and I'm going to say lately, but it might be the last month or two. It, it feels like it's been a little shorter. I don't know if you've made changes, but I've noticed that people have been running some red lights there. Uh, people, a lot of times coming off of Santa Fe, heading eastbound, are sort of accelerating under the bridge and coming up to that intersection. So even not recently, but in the past, um, I've seen a lot of people that just kind of gun it and accelerate through that intersection. So uh, it creates sort of an unsafe situation when they're kind of trying to beat the yellow light. So... Um, I don't know what you guys can do to look at that, but I think that might be something worth looking at. Um, there's probably not a huge traffic. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, Chris, yeah, real quick, I, I missed that. It was Inca, and what, what was the intersection there? Uh, Dartmouth. Dartmouth okay. and Inca. Um, I primarily noticed it heading eastbound, but I mean, it's the same yellow time heading westbound as well, I suppose. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So actually, all the yellows are short pretty much probably throughout the whole city. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually, Dartmouth, we uh, we had some complaints uh, east of Broadway. And uh, uh, I recalculated the yellow and red times. And Chris is actually right now, like like today or tomorrow, he's, work, he's been working on it, of changing them in the computer. So uh, we're actually going to be changing, uh, increasing the yells and red throughout the city. And Dartmouth is actually the first corridor because that was at the one where it'd be most important to safety. Oh, thank you. That sounds yeah. great. The one at Bannock has seemed uh, a little short too. So yeah, I'll they're all they're all pretty much the same, and they're all short, uh, as far as we can tell. Okay. Great. Well, that was that one. Thank you guys for being proactive on that. Appreciate it. Uh, the other one was uh, related to an email I sent out a little earlier in the group. I alluded to it before the meeting for those of you that were on, but uh, uh, basically had some outreach. From, it was a referral from somebody on another city committee who 
who sent somebody my way, um, somebody who walks their kids to school, and they were talking about walking um, along, uh, I believe it's Rotolo Park. Uh, I, I talked very briefly in the UDC meeting about this, but uh, Rotolo Park is kind of one of these long, skinny parks that goes across several roads, and there's not really good connections, crosswalks, or anything between the sections of the parks. Um, I, I don't want to get too deep into it tonight. I'd like to bring it up as a topic in the next meeting. Uh, but I wanted to kind of get people thinking about that a little bit, um, specifically Rotolo Park. And the request out of the citizen was to look into the, I, I believe it's called the Save the Schools Grant. Um, and so just to see if we had anything along those lines. Um, this particular person is crossing Broadway and going to Cherry Lynn. Um, they are not necessarily going to, uh, what is it, Clayton? That's on the other side of Broadway that would be south of their house. Uh, but just in general, I think we have some kids that are going across Broadway both ways um, to go to either one of those schools, kind of depending on where they end up uh, choosing the school to be at. So uh, we just like the community to kind of think about, um, you know, keep that on their mind, safe access to the schools, and then especially with regard to the parks. And, and then I guess my request is with the city to just kind of have maybe an update next time around about uh, if we are doing anything with our, you know, where the status might be with say, the school stuff and, and if that's something that we might be able to incorporate because I think, it, uh, you know, more people walk through that park with their kids to school than we probably think. And so, you know, addressing the park connection issue is kind of a, a tertiary issue to save the school thing. Okay. Well, we can certainly, I, I know Chris said, uh, you had brought this up previously, and I think um, it was just a little bit late, and I think our agenda was quite full, and that was probably some of the reason to table this for the next uh, agenda meeting or next ETAC meeting. So we could certainly speak to that um, at the next one. I think, Guy, is that okay with you as well to put that on that next uh, ETAC agenda? Uh, go you got to unmute yourself there guy <laughs> yeah and that uh yeah i mean uh, yeah we could talk about safe uh uh respond to safe the uh, safe route to schools grant uh process yeah i uh, appreciate that just sort of a little overview of it and then uh, like to discuss as a topic next time um, some of that park interconnections and uh, sort of as a to the safer to school stuff or just uh, you know young person pedestrian access to their education facilities in general so I, I don't think we need to discuss but uh, just wanted to bring it up so people have it on their mind ready for next time okay anything else Chris that's it. All right. Well, that brings us to adjournment. So thanks everybody again for another month at ETAC. So we'll see you here, I guess. Let's see for our November. It's looking to be 12th. So, okay, keep those lines open and we'll see everybody on the 12th. Thanks again. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye.